Welcome and thank you so much for attending today's Future of Oceans lecture, Preventing Extinction, the Story of Southern Resident Orcas. The Future of Oceans series uh, is now in its fifth year, thanks to the Darrow family. Um, they have been great supporters of the Marine Science Center's mission of conservation of the Salish Sea by bringing together research and advocacy efforts through our community and making sure that we have a way to have a platform for getting information out there to everyone. And um, including, since we can't be in person anymore, just having a way to record these and post them on our website for future reference. And I have to say, they do get viewed many, many times uh, after the fact. So thank you so much to the Darrows for your foresight and your ongoing uh, care and concern for the environment and um, for the work that we do at the Marine Science Center. I'd also like to acknowledge that we at the Port Townsend Marine Science Center live um, and work on the traditional lands of the many Kosa people, but particularly the Sklalem people, the strong people. We respect and are grateful for this land and these waters and the people who have inhabited this place since time immemorial and who continue to steward it for future generations. Uh, this is Orca Action Month, the entire month of June in Washington state. And it is a time for raising awareness and celebrating orcas in the Salish Sea. If you, um, I don't want you to go there now, but if you're unfamiliar with the Orca Action Month website, there will be a link to it at the end of this presentation. And you can find out about many events that are going on all around us and actions that you can be involved in to help uh, orcas, especially the Southern residents. And so, we thought who better to bring to the table today than Orca Network. Orca Network as an organization has been around since 1996 and they do this very thing, bring research and advocacy efforts together. Um, for those of you who maybe aren't familiar with Orca Network, it's the place that you go to report a sighting, or to see who other people have reported sighting. And it's where you go to find out the most current information about how the Southern residents are doing among many other things that this organization does. And Cindy Hansen is the education and advocacy coordinator. She's been in that role since 2016, but even before that, her, her life's work is in education and outreach and uh, as a naturalist and guide. And um, so we really were happy to be able to bring the Orca Network's work and passion and Cindy and her team's work highlighted in today's um, lecture um, and give everybody a chance to find out kind of really what's going on right now with orcas and the Southern residents in particular. Um, before I hand over this talk to Cindy, I just need to uh, quickly give you a little bit of a overview. We're going to keep everybody in this limbo land of Zoom where you can't see each other. Only, only we can be seen. Um, and we ask that you keep your mics off and videos off. Um, speaker view seems to work best. I know everybody knows Zoom so well by now, but um, we did decide that we want to keep a, a Q&A as part of this format. And so in Zoom meeting, we're using the chat as a place for you to drop your questions. You can help me by, I don't want to discourage anyone from chatting among yourselves, but I'm going to try to pull questions out of the chat at the end to pass on to Cindy. So if I don't have to wade through too much other information and can just find the questions easily, that would be a great help to me. So thank you. Um, if something doesn't get answered, Cindy is willing to take questions and she would be anyway. And so her address is on here and it will also be on a final slide. So uh, I think that those are all the things you need to hear from me. I do wanna thank Cindy so much for being here. And I know 
that as usual, we will learn so much from you. So thank you again for being part of Orca Month and our Future of Ocean series. Well, thank you so much, Diane. Thanks for inviting me. And uh, thanks everybody for joining on a Sunday afternoon. It's um, kind of sunny where I'm at. I'm on San Juan Island. So hopefully um, everybody else is having a little bit of a sunny day as well. And really appreciate you taking time from your Sunday afternoon to be here. So uh, as Diane mentioned, it is Orca Action Month. So I'm pretty excited to be here. Uh, pretty excited to be here to talk to you about the Southern Resident Orcas and uh, what is going on with them. So Orca Action Month, this is our 16th year. It was actually started by Orca Network. Um, and recently we've had Oregon and British Columbia join. So now it's being celebrated in Washington, Oregon, NBC. A lot of organizations and individuals out there doing education and outreach and advocacy, um, just really trying to get the word out about the Southern Resident Orcas. So really glad to be here today. So Diane already gave you a really great uh, overview of Orca Network and some of the things we do. I just wanted to put a little snapshot up here of some of the programs that we run through Orca Network. Uh, we have our whale sighting network where people can call or email in sightings and that goes out to the public and researchers and policymakers, voter education. Uh, we have a free Lolita campaign, which I'll talk about a little bit later. We run the Marine Mammal Stranding Network for Central Puget Sound. We have a whale center in Langley on Whidbey Island and then education and advocacy, which is my role. So I do want to start out with just kind of some basic information and I apologize to those of you who may already know a lot of this, but I'll just go through kind of the general biology before we get into more specifics about the Southern residents. So the first question that I put up is, is it orca or killer whale? And I have people ask me this a lot and they're actually interchangeable. Um, the name killer whale came from the fact that some of them were actually seen killing and eating other whales. And then over time that got changed, you know, it started out as whale killer. And then over time it just got changed to killer whale. A lot of people don't like that terminology. They think it kind of gives, gives them a bad reputation. So they prefer to call them orcas instead. Orca comes from their scientific name or sinus orca which loosely translated kind of means killer demon from the underworld. So whether you're calling them an orca or a killer whale, it really doesn't matter. And they are technically dolphins. They're the largest of the dolphin family. So the length and weight that I put up here, that's kind of for this area. There are some parts of the world where orcas get bigger than that and some parts of the world where they don't get quite that big, uh, but that's kind of the average for Southern residents. And then their lifespan is about 30 to 50 years on average, but we know they can live a lot longer than that. Um, their lifespan, their life cycle, almost identical to ours in many ways. Um, they're kids for the same number of years we are, they go through the teenage years, they're adults for the same number of years we are, uh, reproductive for the same number of years. Female orcas even go through a menopause right around the same age as human females and then go on to live a long time after that and really contribute a lot to the society. So a lot of parallels between these orcas and humans in terms of lifespan and life cycle. Orcas also have the largest, most complex brain on the planet. And their brains are capable of a lot of the same things ours are in, in some respects, maybe even more so. So higher cognitive thought, intelligence, emotion, empathy, culture, uh, all of these things are available and part of their brains and that all of this makes them self-aware. So it's something that has been shown that they are self-aware, which is uh, a really important thing to keep in mind. And I'll touch on that a little bit later as well. So here in the Salish Sea, uh, we actually have a couple of different types of orcas. And this is something that researchers have found worldwide is that no two orca populations are the same. In different parts of the world, they eat different things. They have different behaviors. They have different uh, languages, lots of differences between orcas around the world. And here in this area, we have two very different types who we can see on a pretty regular basis here in the Salish Sea. There is a third type in the Pacific Northwest as well that I won't really go into detail on. They're called the offshores. 
And as the name implies, they're typically found way offshore, uh, pretty rare visitors into this area. So I'll just concentrate on these two types. They are considered the same species at this point. Some scientists feel they actually should be listed as separate species because they are so different. But right now they are considered the same species and they're just known as basically different ecotypes. So the Biggs orcas are named after Michael Big, who was one of the researchers who started studying them in the 1970s. They are still to this day, sometimes called transients, although they're not so transient anymore. We're actually seeing them more often than we see resident orcas. So most people are starting to use the terminology bigs instead. And they tend to live in small pods, although they will get together in larger groups uh, quite often to socialize, to mate, to travel together. But typically they're in small pods or family groups. So it's typically going to be a female, her kids, maybe a few grandkids, uh, maybe about four to six individuals per pod. And they eat exclusively marine mammals. So seals, sea lions, porpoises. The resident orcas are very, very different. They live in large extended families for their pods. So you've got mom and the kids and grandkids and aunts and uncles and cousins and second cousins, and they stay together for life. So it's kind of like you spending your entire life with all of your relatives. And resident orcas do not eat marine mammals, they eat exclusively fish. And as I'm sure you're aware, their main diet is salmon. Salmon makes up about 95% of their diet, about 80% of their diet is Chinook salmon. So these two different types of orcas, their paths cross, uh, they're in the same waters, they use the same ecosystem, but they're very different. They are genetically distinct, they haven't mated with each other, you know, they've been genetically distinct for hundreds of thousands of years, as far as we know. They don't socialize with each other. They completely ignore each other for the most part when they're in the same waters. They really don't want anything to do with each other. And they don't talk to each other either. They have very different calls, almost like a different language. So the resident orcas we have in the area, as I'm sure many of you are aware, are JK and L pods. And together they make up what is one community, it's called the Southern Resident Community. And they spend a lot of time socializing, mating, uh, traveling together, foraging. So they can actually communicate with each other. And their calls are very similar and they can understand each other. But each pod, this is kind of a, a simplification, but each pod has kind of its own accent, if you will. So it's kind of like having somebody from Washington State, New York and Texas having a conversation. Same language, they just sound a little bit different. The Biggs orcas, on the other hand, are like a completely different language. So I'll play a few clips of these for you so you can hear the difference. Uh, this first one are Biggs orcas. And then for the Southern residents, this is J-Pod. And this is K-Pod, we call them the kittens. And L-Pod, a lot of people think sound like birds. So in listening to those, hopefully you could kind of tell that JK and L-Pod, while they sound a little different, they're kind of similar to each other, whereas the Biggs orcas sound completely different. So that's just another way that these different orca ecotypes are unique from one another. They also have unique cultures. They have behaviors that are passed down through generations, they're socially transmitted and unique cultures and behaviors that only that particular ecotype of orca does. Uh, for example, the Southern resident orcas, they like to swim in kelp and they have greeting ceremonies, or at least they used to, where pods would get together and, and have this ceremony when they're seeing each other for the first time in you know, who knows how long. So very different uh, behaviors that they do that is part of their unique culture. There are also unique individuals in both the bigs and the resident orcas. 
And the way that we can tell orcas apart as individuals, this is work that was done by the Center for Whale Research. They're still conducting orca survey to this day. They started this in 1976. And we're able to determine that they can identify individuals by unique markings. So first of all, the shape of the dorsal fin. Some of them are a little bit more curved, some are more straight, uh, some have notches or cuts in their fins. The other way to tell them apart is by this patch behind the dorsal fin called the saddle patch. And that's a unique shape in every individual as well. So by putting those two together, you can tell exactly who the individuals are. Uh, the three on top are females. The ones on the bottom are males. So the female's fins are two and a half to three feet high. Male orca's fins are about that size as well until they get to be about 11 or 12 years old. And then their fins start to grow and they keep growing until they're about 20 or 21 years old. And with the Southern residents, their fins can get to be maybe about five feet high. So pretty easy to tell the difference between the females and the adult males. You can also tell difference between male and female at any age, if you can see the underside. So they all have a white patch on their belly. If it's a circle shape, it's a female. If it's an hourglass shape, it's a male. So if you hear sometimes when they've determined that a new calf is a male or female, that's not being done by the dorsal fin because obviously um, there would be no way to know that when they're calves. But if you can see the underside, get a picture of that, Center for Whale Research can actually use that to identify whether they're male or female. So because of this, every orca in the population is known. Uh, we know who their families are, we know how old they are. In some cases, it's an estimate if they were around before the study started in 1976. But a lot of work has gone into just kind of the survey of figuring out exactly how many are in the population. Now, before I start talking a little bit about their status, I do want to mention the tribes in the area who have always revered orcas. Orcas are a totem animal, they're sacred. Um, many of the tribes in the area do ceremonies for the orcas, and they're very much involved in orca and salmon recovery efforts. So orcas have always been uh, something that's very sacred and special to them, and they've always respected them. Unfortunately, that hasn't always been the case with the other humans living in this area. So a long time ago, people used to shoot at orcas pretty regularly. They were feared, they were misunderstood, they were thought to be competition for salmon. Uh, it was pretty common to set up rifles at the edges of the islands and just shoot at orcas as they were going by. In the 1960s and 70s, that became the capture era. So a lot of orcas from around the world were captured and taken to marine parks. This area in particular was pretty heavily hit, and we think approximately one third of the southern resident orca population was either removed or killed during the captures. So in one way, Having them in captivity may have helped people understand or appreciate the orcas a little bit more, but it really had an impact on the population, something that they're actually still feeling today because most of the orcas who were taken for captivity were younger ones. So we basically lost almost an entire generation. Fortunately, these two things are illegal now. You can't shoot them. You can't capture them any longer. Um, so again, it's still having an impact on the population, even though it is illegal. Now, once these orcas go into captivity, remember, as I mentioned earlier, in the wild, their lifespan is kind of very similar to ours. It mirrors ours in a lot of different ways. Whereas in captivity, their average lifespan goes way down, maybe average of 10 to 12 years. So all of the Southern resident orcas who were captured in the 1960s and 70s have died, except for one. Uh, this is her. Her original name was Tokitai. She's now known as Lolita. That's her stage name. And she's at the Miami Seaquarium in the oldest, smallest orca tank in North America. There are a lot of efforts to try to bring her back home to a sea pen out here in the Pacific Northwest, uh, possibly somewhere out here in the San Juan Islands. There have been efforts going on for decades to do this. We're a little bit closer now, we think, with new ownership at the Seaquarium. And the fact that the permit that they got transferred over uh, did not include her. So they actually cannot put her on display any longer. So there's a lot of conversations going on and we're hoping that that will lead to something um, eventually sometime soon for her. So if you want more information on these efforts, you can go to our website, which is orcanetwork.org 
or sacredsea.org, which is a website set up by the Lummi Nation, who are very much involved in these efforts as well. Okay, so we had shootings and we had captures and those are both illegal now. They became, they basically ended in the 1970s when the Marine Mammal Protection Act went into effect. And at the time, that's when Ken Balcom started the orca survey to try to figure out how many orcas were in the population. And at the end of the captures, there were only about 70 or 71 individuals remaining. Scientists think this population historically probably had about 140 to 150. So the population had basically been cut in half by shootings and captures. After those things became illegal, the population did start to come back a little bit. And then in the 1990s, it began to decline again and was reduced almost 20% in just six years. This led to them being listed as endangered in both the United States and Canada. But unfortunately, they're still not recovering. In fact, the population is continuing to decline. They're going the wrong direction. So the current population is only 74. Again, only about half of what it historically was and continuing to decline from the time that they were listed as endangered. So we have a lot of work to do, obviously. Uh, the big questions are what's going on now? Uh, what are the threats and what can we do about them? So NOAA has identified three major threats for these orcas. Uh, one of those is noise and disturbance. These orcas live in a very urban area. Uh, they spend a lot of time, or they used to at least, in Harrow Strait, where there's a lot of ships in the area. It is the shipping lane. So you have oil tankers and commercial boats, military vessels, there's construction going on in Puget Sound. So there's just a lot of noise and potential disturbance out there. Uh, the commercial whale watch boats have rules and regulations that they follow. They've been doing that for many years where they keep their distance and shut off their engines. Um, they go slowly around the orcas to try to minimize their noise. So they're doing what they can to minimize their impacts. But a lot of the recreational boaters out there just don't know. They don't know that there are orcas in the area. They don't know that there are regulations they need to follow. So there's a lot of education that needs to be done around that. There is a lot of work being done. There is education happening. There's monitoring. There's enforcement. Uh, we do have new regulations in Washington state uh, for southern resident orcas, as well as in British Columbia, where you have to stay 300 yards away in Washington. You need to slow down to seven knots if you're within a half mile of them, so you're creating less noise. And then there's also a voluntary slowdown for ships in Harrow Strait, again, to try to make less noise if they're going a little bit more slowly in those waters. One of the other big issues is toxicants or contaminants. And these are mostly industrial toxins, things like PCBs, DDT, uh, flame retardants. These actually build up in the food chain. So they start out as tiny little things out there in the water and they're eaten by plankton. And then they build up as they go through the food chain. So each step up the food chain you go, these contaminants become more concentrated. And orcas being at the top of the food chain are getting a huge amount of these. And the orcas in this area are some of the most toxic marine mammals in the world. We don't exactly know what the impacts of these chemicals are, but they certainly could be impacting their immune and reproductive systems. And then the other problem is that not only is the food they're eating full of these toxicants, but there isn't enough food. So again, they are fish specialists, they are salmon specialists, 95% uh, of their diet is salmon, 80% is Chinook, and many of the salmon runs that they kind of evolved to eat are now declining. And some of them have declined as much as 90% in the last 100 years. Salmon are declining for a number of reasons, uh, dams, habitat loss, historical overfishing, which is being monitored a lot better now, uh, pollution, climate change, all of these things are impacting salmon and therefore impacting the orcas as well. The other point to mention um, that NOAA has identified as a threat to these orcas is the potential for an oil spill. If we were to have a huge oil spill in this area, because these orcas travel together in big groups, if they were to encounter an oil spill, it could potentially wipe out the population. 
And just as an example of that, the Exxon Valdez oil spill, which took place in March of 1989, there was a pod of transient orcas called AT1 transients, also known as Chugach transients. They actually swam right through the middle of the oil spill. That population was already small to begin with, but now they are basically functionally extinct. There are only seven individuals left in the population and none of them are reproductive females. So there is virtually no possibility that this population can actually recover. And this was a direct result of an oil spill. So oil spill prevention and response in this area is a really huge part of a recovery plan for these orcas. Now, by contrast, the bigs or transient orcas are actually thriving. The whole West Coast population has around 500 individuals, and we see quite a few of those individuals coming here into the Salish Sea. We're seeing them more often than we ever did in the past. Uh, they're reproducing, they have big families, they're all in really good health, and the population is increasing at a healthy rate. So the question is, why are they thriving when the residents are not? And the big orcas actually have some of the same threats as the residents. They're around the same amount of boat traffic, so same around amount of noise. Um, contaminant levels are also very high. In fact, their contaminant levels are actually higher than Southern residents because they're eating even higher on the food chain. They're eating marine mammals that are eating fish. So the big question is, what's the difference? Why are they thriving if they have some of the same threats? Well, obviously the big difference is food. The bigs orcas are not food deprived. They're eating seals and sea lions and porpoises, and those are all doing very well here, really healthy populations. So there's a lot of food for these orcas, whereas with the residents, obviously there isn't enough salmon. So basically what that tells us, what these bigs orcas are telling us, is that we need to restore salmon. Obviously these other issues matter. We need to prevent oil spills. We need to clean up the water. We need to quiet the water. But what they're showing us is that if they have enough food, these other issues won't be impacting them quite as much. So what are the impacts of lack of prey? Um, one of the things that we have seen with these resident orcas is changes in their social structure. It used to be when you saw a pod, you saw an entire pod. And, and to some extent that is still true with J-pod, but often what we're seeing is pod fractioning. They are splitting apart into smaller groups and spreading apart more to look for food. So is that impacting their social structure or their culture? Uh, these are questions that we have. Another impact is that they're not spending as much time in their poor summer habitat around the San Juan Islands and Gulf Islands. It used to be that May through September, you could count on seeing them on a pretty regular basis. And particularly in the last five or six years, that has really declined to the point where, you know, we don't even expect to see them in May or June and sometimes even July any longer. There, there just isn't enough salmon here to sustain them because they're relying on Fraser River salmon. And with those salmon numbers crashing, they're having to look elsewhere for food. Now, of course, having said that, uh, they surprised us this year and they showed up at the end of May and they stayed, or J-Pod, they stayed for a whole week, which was really surprising to us. That was, was kind of like the good old days where they would show up in May and hang out on the west side of San Juan Island and they were definitely foraging. So uh, that was a good sign. We hope that that means that there is at least some salmon here and that they'll be coming back in. And um, I found it wonderful and surprising that they were here. And they also stayed through the first day of Orca month and then left the next day. So the other impact of lack of prey is we do know that their mortality is correlated with coastwide salmon abundance. So it isn't just one river, one run, uh, it's coastwide. And so what we need to do is concentrate on restoring salmon throughout their range if we want them to recover. So I get asked this question a lot. Why don't they just switch their diet? If there isn't enough salmon, why don't they start eating all those seals and sea lions and porpoises that are here? And it's a really complicated answer to a very complicated question. Uh, a friend and colleague of mine, Monica Whelan Shields, described this really, really well because orcas, again, have very different cultures and different behaviors depending on what population or what ecotype they are. And their entire world revolves around their prey. So they have built their social structure and their culture around the food that they eat. And they spent thousands of years perfecting their hunting technique on that prey. 
So for example, Southern residents are very different in terms of transients, just in the way that they behave when they're hunting for prey. Uh, transients are in stealth mode. They typically hunt in smaller groups. They're silent hunters. They're going after pretty intelligent prey. And so they have to be careful not to be detected by that prey. Whereas the resident orcas can hunt in large groups. They can work together, share their prey, and they can be very, very chatty. They're incredibly vocal. So if we want them to start eating marine mammals, basically we're asking them to change everything that they are. They would have to change their entire culture. And that isn't something that they can do overnight. Uh, that would take a really long time. So that's possibly one of the reasons why they can't just quickly switch their diet. So I wanna just go into a little bit of the research that's going on with the Southern residents and what we're learning about their reliance on salmon and what we can do about that. So I know many of you have heard of this project. It used to be called Conservation Canines. It is now part of Wild Orca called the Southern Resident Killer Whale Health Monitoring Program. And what they are doing is collecting orca poop and they can get a gold mine of information out of that. They can find out contaminant levels, what the orcas are eating, uh, they can find out where those runs were coming from, from the salmon that they're eating. They can get DNA from that, all kinds of information, stress hormones, nutritional hormones, pregnancy hormones, all of that comes out of orca poop. And they actually have a poop sniffing dog. So this is Eva and Eva's job is to sniff out the orca poop. And once she finds it, they're able to go collect it. And once they successfully get the sample, she gets to play with their toy. So that's her big reward. So this is a really great program. Not only is it really fun to watch them on the water and fun to talk about them, but they're really get, getting some amazing information out of this. These are the two dogs that have done this work in the past. The one on the left was the original conservation canine for Southern resident orcas. This was Tucker. He just passed away a few years ago, unfortunately. They lived a good, long, happy life. And, and now we have Eva on the right. And Eva's actually a Disney princess. She's been featured on It's a Dog's Life, as well as all kinds of different documentaries and news stories. And some of the information that they have found is, is really important. First of all, they were looking at stress hormones and what would be causing the orcas the most stress. And it was kind of a surprising answer. Most people thought it was going to be boats, but it turned out to be lack of food. So when they don't have enough food to eat, their stress hormones increase. And it kind of makes sense if you think about it. If you're really hungry, you get kind of grumpy, right? Kind of the same thing with these orcas. The other thing they found by looking at pregnancy hormones is that there is a very high miscarriage rate in this population. So 69% pregnancy loss. And that has been linked to lack of food. Also, when they don't have enough food, uh, they basically metabolize their blubber, which is full of all those contaminants that we talked about. And that can be impacting these pregnancies as well. So what this is telling us, again, is we really need to concentrate on prey. A couple of examples of that reproductive failure. Uh, this was a female. This was one of my, one of my personal favorites, Rhapsody J32. She died in 2014, she was 18 years old and her body actually lost to shore. So they were able to do a necropsy and they found that she was pregnant with a full-term fetus and she had miscarried and wasn't able to expel the fetus and that eventually ended up killing her. So that was kind of the first example right after this research came out of this pregnancy loss. And then I'm sure many of you Remember this uh, from 2018, this was J35 Tahlequah and her tour of grief. After about a two year period without any surviving calves to the population, she gave birth to a little female who only lived for about a half hour. And then she spent the next 17 days carrying this calf throughout the Salish Sea, out to the ocean and back again. And it was coined a tour of grief. And she did so much outreach during that time this became worldwide news and people really woke up to what is going on with these Southern residents. So we basically say that she did a lot more education and outreach in 17 days than we've done in 20 years. So as heartbreaking as this was, kind of the silver lining is that it really woke people up. This is another great research project being done by SR3 and they're doing photogrammetry studies where they're taking photos or videos of these orcas from a drone. 
and they can get great information about the health and body condition. They can monitor them over time and find out if the whales are losing weight, if there's somebody that is you know, of particular concern. So this is an example. This is J35 Teloqua again, uh, after her tour of grief in September of 2019. And in this photo on the left, they said that she looks normal. She looks in good body condition. So that was good news. A year later, in July of 2020, they got another photo of her and said that she looks pregnant. You can see that her girth is a lot wider here. So that was great news, but also, you know, a lot of us were really concerned after what she had gone through the previous pregnancy. But here she is on the right with her new little one born in September of 2020. This is J57 Phoenix, and he is still alive and well. I actually got a chance to see him when they were here uh, at the end of May. And He's got a lot of energy and he's playful and seems to be doing really well. So a little bit of a happy ending to that sad story. Some more research that's going on. Again, the Center for Well Research that does the ORCA survey, they are partnering with the University of Exeter looking at social dynamics. Um, and they're also using a drone to look at social interactions and particularly prey sharing between these ORCAs. So a couple of really interesting things they have found out. Uh, we always kind of knew inherently that the grandmother orchids were really important, but they actually have some data to back that up, saying that these grandmothers are very important to the survival of the rest of the pod. They also found out that these orchids are sharing prey, and that was something that we kind of knew as well. People had observed that from the surface. Um, but what they had thought was that they were kind of just sharing with immediate family members, and what they're finding with these re this research is it isn't just immediate family members, they're sharing prey with orcas that aren't even necessarily closely related to them, which is kind of surprising and amazing to see. So what I wanna do is sh show you a short video clip. Uh, so this is from Dr. Michael Weiss, who is the new research director at the Center for Whale Research. And this is a project that Orca Network took on called Salmon Stories. It's through an organization called Salmon Nation. And they put out a call for uh, fellows to do salmon stories. So what we did at Orca Network is we created 10 short videos, basically highlighting the connection between salmon, southern resident orcas, and the people who care about them. So one of these salmon story stories was with Michael Weiss, and he was talking about prey sharing and some of the drone work that they're doing. So I just want to show you about a two-minute clip from this video that can explain this far better than I ever could. The question of kind of why, why you would share outside of your close kin circle when you yourself might not have enough fish is a, is a really interesting one. I mean, I think it's the same reason we help our friends, right? And if you have social relationships and you care about those other, you know, your, your friends and your family, you're going to share with them, maybe even especially when times are hard, right? And I'm hoping you're there hearing the audio okay. There were two moments of prey sharing this last year that I think were the most surprising for me. The first, in the moment, we were watching the L54 subgroup. So that's L54, her two sons, and then an unrelated adult male. First, we, we just had L54 and her two sons traveling together, um, and we didn't know where the big guy was. And and then we see this you know big shape of a whale coming up with a big fish in his mouth, and we notice him biting it in half. The, the biggest half part goes to L54, kind of the matriarch. She takes it, she breaks that part even further up, and some of that goes back to her two sons. So we have this kind of chain of sharing, starting with this adult male and ending with these two younger males. This was surprising in the moment for us. He is not related to these three other whales. He travels with them. There is main social group, but he's not related to them. The second one, this adult female, shares a fish with with j51 and uh j58 and we're like oh that's that's really lovely you know that's a mom catching a fish and then sharing it with her her two kids uh only to go back and rewatch the footage later and realize that that wasn't j41 sharing that was j22 the whale again not related to these two young whales she did uh, honestly the majority of the work um she took that fish and then shared it with those two, um, despite especially the youngest whale there, J58, kind of messing up the hunt as it was happening. 
it, it felt like a really special moment to be there for. Um, you know, this this whale taking the time to, you know, use her experience to help out two younger kids and make sure they get some food. The question. All right, so moving on to what are we doing about all of this? Uh, we have a lot of information now. There's more research coming out as well about uh, what runs are important at what times of year. And all of this information is being compiled to try to figure out what to do to help these orcas. I know sometimes it feels like it's not happening fast enough. Uh, do these orcas have time for us to do all of these recovery efforts that are going to take time? But there is a lot of work being done by a lot of really good people. And so I just wanted to mention that, yeah, some of it's going to take some time. So we need the short term as well as the long term. Uh, something that did happen in Washington State, which I'm sure many of you are aware of, is that Governor Inslee set up a task force and they met for two years, came up with 49 recommendations that led to new legislation. And that work is still ongoing. Uh, one of the things that came out of the task force was we actually have a new ORCA recovery coordinator in Washington State who is doing a fantastic job. And kind of her role, one of her roles is to make sure that these task force recommendations are being implemented and to continue tracking those. So there's actually a new website about that where you can actually go in and, and see where we're at with these task force recommendations and what's still happening. There's also a lot of work being done in British Columbia. Uh, with management measures in a, in a very similar way as in Washington State. And then I also just want to kind of give a shout out to all of the nonprofit organizations and all of the other conservation organizations out there that are doing a lot of great work, and especially to a lot of the partners that we work with, including the Port Townsend Marine Science Center. You know, we couldn't do a lot of the work we do without these great partnerships and I wanted to put up a slide with all of them, but I was afraid I would inadvertently leave someone out because there are so many. So I'll just say there are a lot of great partners out there with uh, education organizations, conservation, advocacy, tribes, on the ground salmon restoration, individuals. Uh, it's gonna take everybody working together to recover these orcas. So we're very grateful for all the partners that we have. So I wanna quickly give an update on some of the dams. Uh, I'm sure some of you are familiar, or not all of you, with some of these uh, projects that are hopefully going to be happening sometime in the near future. So the Klamath River dams actually uh, are going to come down, supposedly. The agreement has finally been reached after discussing it for years, and they are slated to start coming down next year. So that is really good news. That is actually within the range of the southern resident orcas, and that salmon uh, that could be restored there might be a big boost for them. There's also the uh, new dam being proposed on the Chehalis River, which we are actively trying to stop again with a lot of different wonderful partners. This would be a flood retention dam. Uh, so it doesn't have anything to do with hydropower. It's mostly just for flood retention. So uh, a lot of work being done to try to stop that from happening because that could really impact salmon that the Southern resident orcas rely on. And then in terms of the Snake River dams, there actually is some new news on that. Uh, as of Thursday, a new report was released. This was part of uh, the Inslee Murray plan to create a report on how to replace the services that these dams provide. And I know some people were really critical saying, well, it's, you know, it's just another study, but it isn't just another study. It's actually a report about how can we actually replace all of these services that the dams are providing if they come down. And they're, they are taking public comment on that until July 11th. So I encourage you to read that report and make some public comments on it. Also, as part of ORCA Month, we don't really have the plans in place for this yet, but we're hoping for our ORCA Month closing event on June 30th to have a webinar to discuss that very report, kind of distill it down, help people come up with some talking points. So um, I will get some information out as soon as we have plans on that. But if you want to save the date for June 30th, that is when we're planning on doing that. And here's how you can help. Um, lots of different things that I'm sure many of you are already doing, trying to drive less. Uh, we do know that there is a chemical in car tires that is toxic to uh, coho salmon. So trying to drive less can actually help with that trying to have a better environmental footprint, trying to reduce your carbon footprint, getting involved in salmon habitat projects. 
If you can't do any of those things, just support organizations who are doing those things. And then reporting whale sightings can be really helpful if you report those to Orca Network. That information goes out to researchers and becomes a really important part of the database to learn more about where these orcas are spending time, what areas are important to them. And then also on the Orca Month website, orcamonth.com, we have some actions there as well in honor of J35 Tahlequah and her 17 day tour of grief. We have 17 actions that people can take to help. So if you visit the actions page on the Orca Month website, lots more suggestions on things that you can do. So just kind of uh, last few thoughts here. I do get asked this question a lot. What will we lose if we lose the Southern residents? I mean, we have other orcas here, right? Um, so what would happen if they were gone? Well, in addition to whatever ecosystem impacts there would be to losing a top predator, we would be losing an entire culture, an entire social structure, um, which would just be heartbreaking. And I just wanna quote Alexandra Morton, who I think said this best. She said, if we lose the Southern residents, it will be the first extinction where every individual's name was known. And these are just some of the individuals we've lost in the last few years. But there is hope. I always wanna leave people with hope. Um, so after, I think it was an almost three year period without any surviving calves in the population, we have babies. Uh, just since 2019, these six babies have been born and are still alive. This is the newest one right here, little J59 um, in J-Pod. She was just born in March. I got to see her last week as well. And she, that little whale has so much energy. We were kind of joking that she never swims in a straight line. She's constantly rolling over and her family members are pushing her and she's just the cutest, most active little thing. So this is really good news. We have six surviving babies to this point. There's another one that we might be able to add soon. Uh, there was some video taken off the coast of Oregon that showed a new calf with K-Pod. That calf still needs to be confirmed by the Center for Whale Research whenever K-Pod shows up in the area. But according to the video, it was looking pretty good. And once confirmed, this will be the first surviving calf in K-Pod since 2011. So pretty exciting. Uh, hopefully K-Pod will show up soon and they'll be able to confirm that and we'll have seven little ones that we can celebrate. All right, so with that, I'm going to kind of end the formal presentation and see if there are questions, but I thought what I would do is just kind of show a little bit of video in the background uh, while we're taking any questions. So hopefully this won't be too distracting for people, <laughs> but if you have any questions, feel free to put those in the chat. Thank you so much, Cindy. It, it's really distracting to, um, to watch. How long is your video? Uh, I think it's like three minutes. Like a watch and then ask questions. It's not a hundred questions, so. Okay, whatever you want to do. Don't put it on repeat. I won't put it on repeat. you've all had a chance to see these amazing animals in person but if not hopefully this gives you an idea of just how incredible they are
All right, and then I can just leave this slide up while we do questions. Just wanted to point out a couple of other uh, Orca Month events that we have coming up with Orca Network. We're doing an Orca ID game night, a youth event uh, this coming Wednesday. This will be over Zoom. So if you have any kids of ages who might be interested in that, you can check that out on our Facebook page. And then we're doing a Coast Salish Salmon and Orca Culture webinar on June 25th that talks about the parallels between the Coast Salish and the Orcas and their reliance on salmon. And then for more information on events throughout the region from all of our different partners, you can check out orcamonth.com. Okay, thank you so much, Cindy. There are quite a few questions. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna start, I know everybody can see the chat. So um, I'm gonna start uh, sort of a few down where the question was, um, how do residents identify Chinook salmon? That is a really great question. Hang on, let me bring that screen back again. I accidentally turned it off. Um, they identify it through using echolocation. So they use echolocation to find their food. And basically their echolocation is so good that they can tell exactly what it is, what type of fish it is, what direction it's going, how big it is. Uh, all of that comes from their echolocation abilities. Okay. Um, then I'm not, I'm just going in order here. Um, this question is about breaching the dams and, um, and how to kind of know which, which side of that to be on. Uh, and I don't know if you can see the question, uh, I can't for actually. yourself, but, um, oh, that's right. You've got your screen up. So I'm, I'm for breaching the lower snake river dams, but I'm hearing so many arguments against it that it would hurt the agricultural community over in that area. So which is true? Are the dams obsolete or essential to agri-life over there? That is a great question and I'm glad you asked it. And those dams are still being used. Um, well, the dams themselves aren't necessarily needed for electricity, but the agriculture community does need what those dams provide. Um, which is irrigation and transportation. So that was kind of the idea behind this report that just came out on Thursday was how could we replace those so that, that those communities could be made whole. So it's kind of the answer to your question is kind of both, right? Like those dams are obsolete in terms of electricity and we really do need to take those down to restore salmon for the orcas, but we also need to take care of the people who rely on those dams. So I highly, highly encourage you to get involved in that process that's going on right now. Uh, read that report, make comments on it before July 11th, I think is the, the cutoff date for that. So yeah, that was a really good question. And I think that's something that's kind of, you know, possibly been missing a little bit up to this point is trying to get both sides to come to some kind of understanding of each other uh, and come up with a solution that will work for everybody. Okay. And this is the same person, but different topic um, says, we see that K-pod and L-pod very rarely, are they being tracked and where are they being seen most often? Yeah, that's a great question too. You know, and it's always been the case that J-pod was our more resident, resident orca pod. Uh, they were seen in the inland waters, you know, every month of the year up until recent years. And K and L spot, L pod would spend more time off the coast. Uh, and that is still the case. And so when they're out there, a lot of the times we don't know where they are unless somebody happens to see them or detect them on hydrophones that are out there. We do know that particularly in the summer months, they are spending a lot of time in an area called Swiftsure Bank which is kind of west of the Strait of Juan de Fuca off uh, Vancouver Island. That is a pretty productive area and salmon actually migrate through that area on their way into the Salish Sea. So we know that the residents are spending a lot of time out there in the summer when they used to be here, they're now out there, um, but they have been detected there all months of the year. So we also know that K and L pods will go south, whereas J pod has a tendency to just kind of stick around off straight to Juan de Fuca or even a little bit north of there, K and L pod will go south. So they've been seen off Oregon, they've been seen as far south as Monterey Bay. So a lot of times we don't know at any particular time where they are, but a lot of that data is being compiled as it can be. Okay. Um, so there are a couple of questions about Chinook and 
and fishing practices humans. <laughs> one is, can we just stop fishing for Chinook? And another one is, if we take all salmon off the menu, will that help restore the salmon population for the orcas? That is a really complicated question. Um, and I'm glad you asked it because it is discussed a lot. Um, and a lot of people, myself included, feel like we, instead of basically stopping all fishing, what we really need to do is form alliances with the people who fish because they want salmon just as much as we do, right? We want it for the orcas and they want it for fishing purposes. And, and you also have to think about the tribes. That's part of their culture. They have treaty rights to fish. So we really need to all be working together to restore the salmon. If we can do that, there will be enough for the orcas and the people um, and all of the other species that rely on salmon. So I don't think completely stopping fishing is the answer. I think we really need to do it in a more intelligent way. And that is actually something that's being done, um, or at least starting to be. They're really starting to discuss, you know, how we need to do this and manage this in a, in a better way. And one of the things that just happened last year is that for ocean fisheries, they actually had some meetings and a working group that came up with what they're doing now with ocean fisheries. If the projections for salmon fall below a certain level, then certain management actions will kick in, whether those management actions are area closure, closures or time closures or um, stricter limits. So, and the, the whole idea behind that is to make sure that the salmon doesn't fall so low that there isn't any left for the Southern residents. So a lot of people didn't feel like that threshold was high enough. Um, they felt like it didn't leave enough for the orcas, but it was a really great first start. And it was actually pretty monumental. This is the first time that the, the orcas have really kind of been considered in fisheries. So it was a huge step. And we just need to keep having those conversations and figure out the best way to make sure that there's enough salmon for everybody. Okay. Um, this these questions are more about the uh, who who's where, but one of them was: Is L87 still traveling with the J pod, or has he gone back to the L's? Yeah, good question. So L87 is no longer with J pod. He went back to L pod. Um, as of last or last year or the year before that. So yeah, last time we saw LPOD, he was traveling with them, a particular family group at LPOD. So yeah, for those of you who don't know who L87 is, he's, he's kind of the pod hopper. Uh, after he is an LPOD whale and after his mother died, he switched and started hanging out with a few older females in K-pod. And then when they died, he switched to J-pod and was hanging out with some older females there. And then when they died, he kind of hung around in J-pod for a little bit longer. And now he's back with his original pod, but a different family group of his pod. So it's just amazing that he just keeps kind of finding these, you know, these new family members to take him in and, and kind of help lead him. Um, and this, this question is from Paul, and he was asking how big J-35 is today, but I'm not sure if he means J-35 or J-57. Sorry, Paul. Um, you know, I'm not sure. Well, if the question is like in terms of her body condition, uh, they oh. have not been out with the photogrammetry team yet this year to get any of photos, of recent photos of J-Pod. Unfortunately, they weren't here when J-Pod showed up at the end of May, um, which surprised, you know, they all surprised us. We didn't think we were gonna be seeing them in May. And so um, that was kind of unfortunate. It would have been great for them to be able to get a drone over them and, and just kind of look at body condition. But uh, so as far as I know, like, I don't know if this is answering your question, but as of last year, as far as I know, she was looking like normal body condition. She was looking good. Um, and this year, from what I understand, from what the Center for Whale Research was able to see, there wasn't anybody of concern. Um, nobody that they said, you know, was immediately standing out to them as being a whale of concern. But we'll have to wait until SR3 gets out there and does their photogrammetry study to know that for sure. Okay. Um, and I know we're running out of time, but um, one of the questions was, what evolutionary purpose does the larger, huge male fin serve? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the, as far as we know, the big male fin is is mostly for, you know, it's a way of saying, hey, I'm a big, strong 
male and you should be attracted to me. So that could be the whole reason for it uh, is, you know, some people think also like the dorsal fin we do know in whales can help with stability. So that could be the case too, because you have this really big animal, they're much bigger than the females. And so the bigger dorsal fin can help them with stability moving through the water, but it also uh, is just a, could be just a secondary sexual characteristic that helps attract the females. Okay. Um, this is a unre sort of unrelated, but uh, the question is when the Southern residents travel North, do they mingle with the Northern residents? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, as far as we know, they do not. They seem to completely ignore each other, just like the residents and the big Zorkas do. Um, we know their paths cross, uh, but they just really don't seem to want anything to do with each other. There was, I want to say it was about four or five years ago. I don't remember exactly, but Southern residents were actually up in Johnstone Strait, where the Northern residents typically are. And there was a pod of Southern residents and a pod of Northern residents who actually crossed paths and one stayed on one side of the strait and one stayed on the other and they just completely ignored each other. Okay. Um, yeah, I think that your comment about like having people report when they see things is so important because we, we really, it's not like we have, you know, our orca cams on all the time to know what they're doing and the more, observations there are of where they are and when they're there the, the more we can know so everybody pay attention report Absolutely. your sightings um, that community science is so important very important um, and don't just assume that somebody else has already reported it if you see something you know please send it in we'd rather get a report 50 times than not, not at all yeah um there was a question about uh do you partner with orca sound which we do. We partner very closely with Orca Sound. In fact, their Bush Point Hydrophone is managed by Orca Network. So they are a great partner and we love working with them. So for those of you who don't know that one of the other hydrophone sites is at Port Townsend Marine Science Center. So look at orcasound.net and you can also get uh, alerts on your phone to know when something's being heard. And so that's another great place to like see what's going on and hear recordings and find out more about sound, the sound of orcas. Um, let's see, I feel like I missed something. There was another question about what, what do you know about orcas in the British Columbia area? Um, yeah, so in British Columbia and obviously the Southern residents spend time in British Columbia, um, but also the Northern residents are in British Columbia, sometimes up to Southeast Alaska. And a lot of these big orcas that come into this area also travel into British Columbia. Um, so a lot of the same individuals as well as the same ecotypes um, in that area. Obviously, you know, we recognize a border, but they don't, so they cross it a lot. Um, we're, I know we're kind of at the end of our time, I wanted to just let people know that we did record this entire thing and we will post it on the Port Townsend Marine Science Center uh, website. There'll be a link to it there. Um, if you have follow-up questions for Cindy Hansen that did not get answered, um, you can email her. Uh, I would also encourage you to go out and visit the Langley Whale Center to find out about orcas and other whales in the Salish Sea. It's just such a great place to go visit. And um, thank you, Cindy, so very much for being with us today and for all of the information you shared with us. And um, we, we will continue to celebrate and do what we can during Orca Action Month and for the rest of the year. I'm seeing that people are also popping in messages. If you could get out of your screen just to see all the thank yous to you for all of the educational work you do and the advocacy work you do. And um, yeah, there are little heart emojis popping up. And so thank you so very much. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. And thank you everybody for joining today and for all your great questions. And hope you can all get out there and either do something for Orca Month or attend another event or, you know, just celebrate them in any way that you can.